Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Associate Director of Public Programs and Events here at the IDA. Uh, I'm actually coming to you today from the IDA's offices here in Los Angeles on the unceded land of the Tongva and Chumash people who have been stewards of this land for generations. I would like to, before we begin, offer a thanks to IndieWire, our media sponsor, for bringing us uh, the IDA documentary screening series this year. And I encourage you all to go to our website, uh, which is documentary.org slash screening series, where you can find all of our upcoming films. We're right at the beginning here. So we have films coming all the way up through December. Uh, all of them have lovely moderated Q&As like this one. Um, and so without any further ado, I'm going to invite on here journalist and all around star Travel Anderson to get this conversation started around Hulu's changing the game. Welcome, Travel. Thank you so much, Cassidy. I'm excited for this conversation. As Cassidy said, I'm Travel Anderson, a journalist, and I'll be our moderator for today. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all who are watching. Um, help me welcome our two panelists today from the film Changing the Game. We have director Michael Barnett, as well as producer Alex Schmitter joining us today. There we go, there they are. Thank you both for joining us. Um, I'll just jump right on in and get started with you, Michael. Talk to us a little bit about the idea, how the idea for changing the game kind of came to you and, and made you set on this path of, of doing the film. Yeah, um, hopefully I'm not breaking up too much here. I'm in the woods in Maine, but um, <clears throat> The idea sort of didn't start as an idea for a film. It really started as um, a place for me to, um, you know, just get to a place where I could help uh, some uh, a family and specifically a human that was transitioning that I really, really love. And when they came to me really early for uh, support, support in our community specifically to help sort of you know, create uh, um, this narrative for our community and and, uh, and help sort of share, uh, I realized very quickly that um, I had work to do. And uh, I certainly had not earned any allyship by then. And, um, and I had been a filmmaker for a lot of years. And so I just, without even thinking about making a movie or anything, I just got to work and, um, you know, started reaching out, uh, and I'm, I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin. I went to uh, Gender Odyssey in Seattle. And I mean, really just a, a lot of like, <clears throat> just get as much information as I can so I could be there for this family and, uh, and be there for, you know, uh, the rest of her life with, uh, you know, love and support. And during that journey, um, I came across Mac's story and um, I just thought it was a very quickly was helping me digest a lot of what I was asking and thinking about and processing. And as a filmmaker, when you know, um, when you sense that there's a really extraordinary story to tell, it's hard to shake it. And I still wasn't thinking about making a film. Um, and I still hadn't reached out to Mac yet, uh, but we, we reached out to Alex at GLAAD um, and really started a conversation, right? A, a conversation about, you know, should this film exist? How should this film exist? What's it look like? What should the team look like? And from there we went on the journey and that was in, gosh, 2017, I think. Um, then we spent about a, you know, a year traveling around and talking with kids before we ever brought a camera and meeting their families. Yeah, it's, it's been a process and a journey for sure. I love that. Let's bring you in here, Alex. You know, with your work at GLAAD, Filmmakers, creatives always come to you all, right? For for advice, for suggestions. They want, you know, a sensitivity read on something. What about this project and this idea kind of spoke to you and made you, you know, want to sign on as an actual producer of it? Absolutely. And thank you so much, IDA and Travel, for moderating the conversation. You know that we're big fans of yours. So it's an honor to be here. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, as you said, I get approached a lot, Glad, to look at stories, talk with filmmakers about how to tell authentic and accurate stories about the trans community with respect to the people that these stories are purported to be about. And so when I got a cold call from Michael and Claire Tucker, my co-producer, I was like, who are these people? Like they want to tell a story, a documentary about young trans children who play sports. Like every red flag was going off in my head. And I was like, I mean, I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to tell them the truth. That's my job. Um, and immediately when I met with them, though, not only was the intention there about what they wanted to do, which was really to restore these stories to these young people, which had so cruelly and so cruelly are taken away from them and used against them, but they were committed to doing the work, as I also was, because I also had to go through my own unlearning process and overcoming discomfort around why do we have these feelings and beliefs about the topic of trans inclusion in sport, and, you know, that's part of my work at GLAAD is understanding the media that we're consuming and then how we're understanding the world because of it. And so when I met Michael and Claire, I was like, I just believe in this team of people and I believe we can do the work and respect these young people um, so long as we're willing to have difficult conversations and deeply collaborate and trust and respect what each of us is bringing to the table. And ultimately, I think that's why I'm so proud of the film, because also the young subjects in it feel proud of the stories that we were able to help uh, share, you know, with them. Yeah, Michael, you spoke a little bit about how you all kind of traveled the country talking to different folks before you even brought in a camera. Could you give us a little bit more details about that? That's search process to find out who the main subjects will be in the actual selection process. That came in and out. So Alex, I'll let you start it and jump in once I figure out what we're talking about. Yes, you'll know exactly. So, you know, we really started 2016, 2017. And at the time, there weren't a lot of out trans athletes because you know, it's not a safe environment for the most part for many. Um, and so it really started with Michael and Claire going to Gender Odyssey, talking to different families, getting connected with different organizations like Trans Family Support Services, um, the Trevor Project, GLSEN, uh, and also Chris Mosier is an executive producer on the film. Um, and so he had a network of young athletes that he was often mentoring. And so it was you know, a combination of, um, you know, using social media, using organizations, and always being sensitive and mindful of the facts. I mean, we'll get into this later, but thinking about who would ultimately be included. But at first, it was just a, let's see who's out there as best we can. Michael, I'll let you weigh in. Yeah, it's interesting, right? This conversation um, or debate or whatever anyone's calling it now <clears throat> lives under the assumption that, you know, there's trans athletes far and wide uh, in, in youth sports programs. It was a struggle to find any and certainly more of a struggle to find any who would want to tell their story on camera. Um, you know, the fact that Mac graduated high school in 2018 and he's still the focal point of, you know, trans youth in sports, I think speaks to uh, uh, how few trans youth have the courage and resilience to actually play sports, right? Um, and so as we started this process, you know, we sort of definitively um, had a sense of putting a spotlight on kids. Um, and, you know, someone like Sarah Rose, who's like, please point the spotlight. I want the spotlight, you know, <laughs> give it to me. There, there, are, there are other um, kids in our film who we spent a lot of time with, right? A, a, a lot of time with them and their families before we started filming. Um, and then we started the journey of filming with them. And then we had really, really tough conversations about why we felt um, it was inappropriate to keep them in the movie. And because it felt, you know, at times maybe not safe for them. And those are very, very tough conversations for us to have, particularly how far down the road we had gone with some of these uh, athletes and kids and families. 
And, um, and it was very heartbreaking for us to have to share the information with them that we felt it was in their best interest for us to not continue. Um, and, and then we end up, you know, with Andrea, Sarah, and Mac, who I think their participation in the film has empowered them, you know? Um, and that's a very different, uh, you know, possible result than we thought for some of the, the um, youth that we are working with. Uh, yeah, tough stuff, um, tough conversations to have. And, you know, I think when, when it came to sort of, you know, finding, you know, the people that we really wanted to, to zero in on and focus on, uh, I mean, it took nearly as long as it did to make the film as it did just to find, um, you know, the humans that we thought would, A, uh, I think thrive in this space, especially now that the film is sort of living in the space it's in. I mean, everyone, when you're sharing up at their house with a camera, they're like, great, wonderful. Um, but this is a different thing where the film is now, right? It's a different spotlight. So what is that spotlight? Is it healthy or unhealthy? And that's things we have to consider years ago. Yeah, I mean, something you said, Michael, made me think of a scene in the doc um, I think it's Andrea's mom in Gozi who talks about wanting to protect her child as Andrea is becoming kind of more public because of, you know, all of the media attention that, you know, her excellence and Terry's excellence was was garnering there. I'm wondering how how all of that impacted you all's responsibility, you feel like internally as filmmakers, um, because we are dealing with with youth. It is a very, in my, my eyes, unnecessarily politically charged conversation. I'll start with you, Alex. What did you see as like kind of your own responsibility as a member of this filmmaking team as it relates to these young people? Well, I mean, that was my priority throughout. Obviously, I want us to be able to tell an impactful um, and compelling story, but underneath all of that at the core what drove me to be so active in my participation was also making sure that their stories that we were sort of a vehicle for sharing was always in their best interest and respecting who they are as people and that continues as soon as the film was picked up by hulu um, and shared with the wider world i'm in constant touch with these young people um, we have conversations about what opportunities do you want to do, which do you not, making sure they're getting paid for any speaking engagements that they're being asked to do, and checking in on their mental health, first and foremost. I mean, they are the most important parts of this entire filmmaking process. It just so happens we made a film that has been able to drive such impact with the conversation and really humanizing right. these young people. Um, but it was always central um, to my role was that in advocating for what, you know, showed up on screen all the way to how they're feeling day to day and what their advocacy and activism looks like, empowering them to say, you can do what feels right to you and no one else gets to determine that for you. And so it's been one of the most rewarding parts of my career and journey here is, is watching them grow up and step into, I mean, they're, they've, all, they've always been great, but truly continuing to step into their greatness in a way that is continually authentic to them. You know, and something that I think is really specific, you know, you started this question with Ngazi. And Ngazi, I don't, you know, we had really long conversations with Ngazi before she, um, you know, gave her blessings for Andrea to be part of the film. And, Andrea's story was just beginning its crescendo, right? Obviously it garnered a lot of noise. And, you know, I think Ngazi, um, I know Ngazi felt like being a part of the film would actually be healthier for Andrea because she would get a, to have a say finally, instead of having her voice constantly, you know, presented by somebody who doesn't know her, knows nothing about her, right? Who are, you know, speaking from this, uh, you know, place of authority or journalism or whatever it may be, when it was the exact opposite of. Um, and so, you know, each, I think, you know, each of these athletes had a, a very different intention. And I really love Ngazi and Andrea's intention, which is really our intention as well. Like, how do we give these stories to the kids and be as authentic as possible in sharing them? And I think, uh, maybe Sarah Rose and Mac weren't 
absolutely aware of that. I think they were just really happy to share their stories, which was really authentic. And you can see that too. But I think Ngozi and Andrea were really aware from the beginning that this was actually the goal because um, I think they could both sense that the needle was moving in a different direction. I love what you both are saying because I feel like, you know, this is an IDA crowd, right? We're talking to documentary filmmakers. There's a history in the documentary sphere in particular of, um, to be quite honest, not caring about subjects, particularly queer and trans subjects, right? That, that are at the center of these stories, not protecting them in the ways that you talk about Alex. And so I love hearing you all detail kind of those considerations that y'all took into place before even starting the project. Um, but because it is documentary filmmakers, Michael, I wanna come to you. A lot of times folks in the audience love to know some of the tech and process things that help bring the film to us. So first and foremost, I wanna ask about the visual language of, of the film. What did you want to convey with the visual language there? Yeah, I wanted to bring a real intention to the visual language. And we really held ourselves accountable to do something really specific, right? We shot the film on vintage anamorphic lenses, on really nice cameras, airy minis, and very cams. These are not documentary cameras, you know? Um, and these are not documentary lenses. Uh, I came up, you know, as a cinematographer, uh, shooting lots of documentary stuff with staff at Discovery Channel in my 20s. and and. Um, and then sort of moved into a different space, you know, creatively, visually in my 30s, you know, doing lots of branded work, commercial work and documentary work and trying to combine all those things in this film to create a really cinematic language, right? For a very specific reason, because we have, particularly in America, but I would say globally, this expectation of a visual cinematic language when it comes to athletes. Right. And I wanted to utilize that language, that deep cinematic language to present these stories because they deserve it. Right. They are good at what they do. They should be deified as much as any other athlete who gets a camera pointed at them. So we brought that cinematic language with a ton of intention and we really wanted the film to look, you know, um, uh, very specific, you know, like a. LeBron James Nike ad for 90 minutes. You know, we really wanted to hold ourselves accountable, which is hard to do when you're shooting with like a two person crew uh, you know, on a documentary budget. Um, but I'm really proud that we stuck with it because at times, particularly at like live sporting events where we have just a camera or two um, and, you know, my cinematographer Turner and I, we're both running around with a camera. Um, I mean, just like bananas, you know? and uh, just trying to get every moment. And you wouldn't know it watching the film. It feels like we, for some reason, we just happen to be at the right place at the right time, catching those dramatic moments because sports are need to be in a lot of places uh, uh, when that moment's happening. So yeah, uh, it, it was a big intention of ours, you know, um, to put a lot of craft into the look of the film and to be consistently so, not to just get lazy and be a fly on the wall, sort of sloppy handheld, which is really easy to do in documentary, right? Um, to always, always hold ourselves to that standard because these stories deserved it and deserve it. And and Alex, I wanna ask you on that same tip, because um, I'm assuming you you had something to do with this, you know, when it comes to documenting athletes, right, there often is so much focus on, on the athlete's body, right, on the ways in which they are accomplishing the, 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 the feats that they're accomplishing. But with trans folks, there are other considerations in place in terms of like where the camera lingers, how long it lingers on certain places. So I'm wondering, you know, from your vantage point, what was important for you as it relates to what we see on screen in terms of, of similar to what Michael is saying, kind of respecting and uplifting, you know, these trans youth, you know, in the authenticity of their beings? Yeah, and thank you for the question, Travel. And to, what everything Michael said, I mean, you know, the cinematic language, the visual aesthetic that was created was really showing these young people as the heroes in their own stories, which is so counter to what we typically see in news media and even some other documentaries, which is all about focusing on trauma and tragedy and not the strength and resilience it takes to be yourself in a world that tells you you can't. And so, well, 
Michael and the documentary film crew captured, I mean, we were, we were filming with the kids for like, and they, they were kids, they're no longer kids, but like a year, a year and a half. I mean, they captured everything that the young people wanted to share, but in the edit, we had a lot of consideration and understanding about the collection of other stories out there and how trans people's bodies are looked at. And that often reduces and gets away from the actual humanity of these young kids who are just trying to be themselves and play the sports that they love. And so, you know, interestingly, it wasn't all that hard to get away from um, the, the focus on body because yes, that's important to them. Obviously it's important to all of us, but in terms of moving the story forward, it added very little to how, these, how we're relating to these young people as audience members, as people who want to root for them and their families and sort of not important. Um, outside of, you know, when we get to see Andrea run across that sunset, it's like, that's when we're seeing her body and she looks and the only way I can describe it is you, you feel embodied watching that because that's, she's being able to be herself. So um, I hope that answers the question, but it was, it took a lot, we had a lot of conversations about what would fit in and what, and maybe Michael has more to add to. I, I do because he, he, you answer this question beautifully with a nonchalance that I think is very important, but the nonchalance that came at the very beginning of, you know, us bringing home dailies and Alex watching, you know, very early, early stuff and saying, you know, um, and educating me very, very quickly and saying, you know, we're not going to focus on body parts. And I'm like, well, it is a sports movie. Uh, and he's like, great. We're not going to focus on body parts. And I'm like, okay. I mean, it's, it's a sports film. Uh, and he's like, yep, 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 yep. Here, yep. We're not going to focus on body parts. And I'm like, okay, can you tell me why? And his answer was that it's not the most interesting part of any of these humans. And I was like, okay, well, that's actually pretty simple, right? Although it took a lot of conversations. <laughs> to, to, <laughs> for, for the simplicity of that I mean to sink it. in, right? The simplicity of that needed to sink in. Uh, I had to get there, right? Uh, Claire had to get there, our editor, you know. And by the way, I, this, yeah, it, it was just like every sort of step of the way of like, okay, let's have these really tough conversations, right? We are making a sports film and it's not about body parts. Okay, great. It sounds very easy right now to say that. Uh, and then it was easy once that understanding was in place, right? Because then you go out there with an intention and you know where not to point the camera. So, um, yeah. It's, uh, well, yeah. well and, and I want to give some respect back. To, I mean, you, we all created these really intimate relationships with these families and these kids. And when you think about it more generally, it's like, we don't need to be invading any child's privacy and personal space. Like it's not a trans issue. It's like, let's respect and give agency to these young people without taking it away. And, and I wanna say to Michael's point, I would not have signed up to be a part of this film, which was an immense challenge for me when I signed up. I had no idea how we were gonna do it because I was even dealing with my own discomforts. But I knew that Michael and Claire and everyone who worked on the team was willing to do the work with me. And we were willing to trust and listen to each other and respect. And there were things that I was very adamant on ended up in the film. I think they deserve to be there um, because every single frame, every single word, there is intention with it because we know how sensitive it is for trans people out there and what arrives on screen doesn't just live on the screen. It goes out into the universe and we took that responsibility very seriously. Mm. Over, uh, to, that, and over yeah. <laughs> to that point, I wanted to ask about, you know, the decision to keep in, you know, the, the folks who are misgendering the athletes while they're competing. Um, I think Max's grandparents, we see on screen them, you know, messing up, but then correcting themselves fairly quickly. Um, talk about those conversations that you all had about, you know, those things, which, which can be traumatic, can be triggering for, you know, some people. 
let me start first with uh, Mac's grandparents in that the intention with making this film, I mean, it's always about who's your audience. Like, who are you trying to talk to? Who are you trying to reach? For us, it was a pretty broad audience. We wanted to reach everybody, quite literally everyone. No matter how familiar or unfamiliar you are with trans people, if you are a trans person, if you're a family member of a trans person and on your journey towards supporting them, no matter where that is on the spectrum, we wanted this film to be for you. And, and also if you're a sports person and like, you know, film shot like Nike ads, that's also a plus. Um, it's interesting in screening the film and, and with that intention of mind of, okay, we, we want to reach the widest um, group of people while being very specific, the instances of misgendering that happen with Grandma Nancy and Grandpa Roy are some of the most profound often that I've heard from trans people in that there is often a, an assumption that this journey is like you, you have a new name and you're using new pronouns and everyone gets it within a flash. Right. And that is not actually reflective of reality, nor necessarily reflective of the love that is there and wanting to go on the journey with these young people and with people who are trans. And so I think it's a little poetic in when Grandma Nancy runs with Mac at the end, she says, I'll run with you. I may not get there as quickly as you do, but I'm, I'm coming with you. And that, that, part of it has really been one of the most impactful for audiences that there is room to go on that journey to grow together and it's not instantaneous um and so i'll let michael speak to the difficult conversations about you know the haters that we well, the, the hater the haters are interesting we use them with a deep intention right i think the first kind of um nuggets of hatred that come out in the film are um visceral and i think mm -hmm. I don't think, I know, we've we've shared the film with lots and lots of people, but by the time you get to the end, uh, the audiences are laughing at the haters. And that was a journey for us, right? Um, and I think also we are very thoughtful about where we put it in the film uh, because it is a constant reminder. I think if you sit with these kids in their stories, in their humanity, in their um, humor, right? In their day-to-day -day lives, we do need to be reminded um, what they're up against, the hate they're against. And and I think it's important, we could have really lingered on it a lot longer. We could have gone home with some of those haters. We could have uh, shared their stories and given them a different agency. Um, and we chose not to. Uh, the only person we chose to do that was was Chelsea uh, Mack's opponent, who we really gave a lot of agency to because, man, she was there for the right reason. You know, um, I, I, she could help educate a lot of people. And uh, and so I think the way that we um, sort of very thoughtfully put that hate into the film was done in a way that's a constant reminder of what these uh, athletes are up against and also hopefully diminishing the agency of that voice through the film with a lot of intention. Because I hope yeah. by the film you've seen enough of their humanity to realize that this is absurd. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've spoken a lot about, I think, the, the education aspect of, of this particular topic, but, you know, I also want to let people know that I also find it very entertaining. Like, it is still a, you know, um, it's still a sports movie. It still gives you that idea and that element of competition. Um, you know, I was watching it earlier today and I cried all over again, got goosebumps all over again. So it's still entertaining in that particular way. Could y'all talk about striking that balance of doing the education that is necessary, unfortunately, with a topic like this, but also making sure to still deliver something that is entertaining, emotionally, you know, enthralling for audiences? Well, I think we all hoped, you know, it's subjective. Obviously, everybody watches a film and has their own journey through that experience. But I think, you know, our intention was to make a film that was more of a subtle education and much more of a experience, right? We didn't want it to feel like a homework assignment. We don't want it to feel like a burden to, you know, I don't want you to have to endure the film. I want you to have to um, 
immerse, you know, because it does require your presence and your emotions. And hopefully it is visually striking. Hopefully you do respond to the music. Hopefully you do respond to the edit and the rhythms of the edit and see the, and get a sense of the craft and the intention we put into it. And hopefully you just sit there and watch a really good film. Uh, that was certainly from day one, everything we set out to do. I never wanted to make a homework assignment. You know, I really wanted to make, lovely, sweet, sensitive, tender film that takes you um, on a emotional journey. Yeah, and I, and I think some of the best, uh, the best education comes from entertainment that um, is an exercise in empathy. Um, you know, learning about people who may not be in your life, experiences that you may never had, but you can relate to that element of humanity. And so, I'm, you know, Travel. when, when I finally, you know, heard what you thought of the film, I was, I mean, I respect you so much. And so when I, when I heard what you thought that meant so much, because it is not only about, you know, doing right by the community, um, but it's also making something that you want to watch that's compelling, that emotionally invigorates you. And I, I just want to, you know, give a shout out to our editors as well, who the pacing, you know, you, you're going on the journey and you're not wanting to stop. And when there are really heavy moments, like when Ngazi is talking about Andrea's safety, um, you know, they're followed by moments of levity of this isn't just all one emotion or one side of things. This is people's lives are messy, they're complicated, they move. And I, anyway, I'm talking now a lot, but I, we could talk so much about the craft of the film. And Michael has said, like, we don't need to talk about the craft because it's, it's amazing that people are just relating and loving on, you know, our young athletes, but the level of craft that went into the film is, is also just exceptional. And I had nothing to do with that. Um, oh, I'm happy to talk about the craft. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was hard. We put a lot of energy into it. And I, you know, I think another one of our big things is we didn't want to make a niche film, you know, that sort of lived in a, a small space. We wanted to make a big film in a big space that took up a lot of oxygen, you know, and we want the film to continue to take up a lot of oxygen. We want people to see it. Yeah, I mean, and you know, stories about trans people deserve to take up all of that oxygen, Without just a doubt. like all the other stories, right, Without that a doubt. are out there. Um, one of the things I was interested in that I often like asking filmmakers is, you know, what's something that didn't make it into the final cut of the film that's on the cutting room floor that still has stuck with you throughout this entire process? We have a whole storyline that we shot um, of a remarkable kid in Seattle. And, uh, and we did not pull this um, story out because uh, the kid or the family were sort of too sensitive. We did it because it just didn't make sense editorially. It was hitting on a bunch of the same themes. And it was a very, very hard decision for us to do. And it was a just um, an incredible family, an incredible story, an incredible kid who probably um, was able to convey presently a, uh, a really profound, um, I don't know, esoteric sense of life at 17, 16 years old in a way that was really profound to experience. And, uh, you know, and, and we just went on a, an extraordinary journey with him and his family. And it broke my heart to have to, you know, make the very tough decision. And when you're when you're making a film, and it wasn't, it wasn't anything other than um, the story just kind of fell, you know, with too many parallels with another story. So super super tough, uh, and it breaks my heart. And I wish um, we had a a big place, you know, for that story to to find, you know. An audience as well. I don't know. We shall see as, as we continue. Uh, hopefully there'll be an opportunity to, to, to bring that story to light because it wasn't like we went there once, you know, mm -hmm. these were, these were, you know, kids going through high school. So we would go back a lot 
um, and really get to know these families. So that one, that one was really, really tough for me. Um, and still is because it, it's a it's a really emotional story. It's a lovely story, and I wish uh, the world can experience it. Alex, anything for you? I was trying to think through it, and I I am so in love with this film as it is. I I think there's nothing I would pull or at. I told in our final edit before we went to Hulu, I told everybody that there was a certain place in the film that I always went to the bathroom in during at film festivals. We have now fixed that part, uh, <laughs> tightened it up. Now I don't go to the bathroom when I watch the film. Um, but I would say the one thing that I is missing, but it wouldn't have been possible to include is when all the young athletes met each other. Um, and the family that they immediately created when we premiered at Tribeca. And they just went off on their own. They went to a diner in New York without us. And those kinds of friendships and that shared experience will be with them for the rest of their lives. And I, there's a part of me that wished we could have shown that and continue to show you know, what happens when you do receive this kind of love and support and community. Um, these young people are extraordinary um, and they are in some parts extraordinary because of the love and support that they've had. And I hope that when people watch, in addition to being just blown away by who they are and how they navigate the world, um, they see that we all have the capability of being an Angazi, of being a Grandma Nancy, of having that love that can transform and change and even save someone's life. I love that. I wanted to ask, you know, we started our conversation talking about, you know, where both of you were in kind of your own educations and your own places at the start of the process with this film. Now that you've completed it, it's out there in the world. How did the film change you? And how do you hope it changes audiences who watch it? That is a complex question for me because it's easier, it's easy for me to, um, I think have perspective now and forget where I was then. But I think it's helpful for me to try to remember what, where I was then to process this perspective now. But um, this is a tough question. It, it's like, what hasn't changed, you know? Sorry. All right. It's, uh, I mean, my entire DNA. So, yeah, so much. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's the same for me because, you know, this really was my first filmmaking journey. This was my first uh, experience really getting to also collaborate and learn from people who are willing to mentor me in addition to getting to mentor and hold the young people in the film and for me it hasn't stopped it's it continues i it has fundamentally changed me as a person as well and how i think about every little thing that i do um and we're continuing that in, in our impact campaign. I mean, it is all about how can we harness what we have gotten from this experience and hoist that uh, and give to other people. DNA, I mean, Michael says it, but I am an entirely changed different person and better person for the experience. I love that. Well, thank you both for putting this brilliant documentary together. I've been telling people that this is one of those films that could have been a great resource when I was calling myself being a cross country runner. Um, you know, back in the day, <laughs> it would have been great to, you know, help out with a little something, something. Uh, but thank you both again for, for putting this together and for the care that you both put into this process. If you haven't seen Changing the Game yet, it's on Hulu. I don't know what you're doing. All right. But thank you both again. And all of you are watching. We hope you all have a great morning, evening, afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Travel. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, IDA.